Yeah. That might be a good thing for him. Well, I said he had to get him processed and that price had to be included. So he probably doesn't know how to figure out how much he needs and stuff. You know? Well, well, you know, if he lands put the bar around, he could do pretty well even yeah, at New yeah. Holland because the prices there all through the spring were really good. Hi, Gabby. Yeah. We're, we're gabbing, Gabby. <laughs> Yeah. And I turned, I paused the recording uh, because we were making, we were just chatting. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Betsy Hodge, and I work at the Cornell Cooperative Extension in St. Lawrence County. And uh, Gabby Warmoth is working with me tonight. Uh, we put together the program uh, for tonight. She works at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Jefferson County. So since we're doing things on Zoom, it makes it pretty easy to work together and not have to travel So, or wear a mask or any of those kind of things. So we can't serve cookies, but there's other advantages. So we're glad you could join us tonight. We're going to talk about raising bottle lambs and kids. And uh, we're going to talk about two phases of that. Like um, there's bottle lambs that you have. You don't really want a lot of bottle lambs, but you have to raise some. And then there's bottle lambs that you raise on purpose because you um, are milking your goats or your sheep, or maybe you are on a um, program where you're um, trying to pasteurize the milk when you feed it or something to control diseases. So there's a couple of things going on. So I'm gonna ask you all to turn off your videos and to mute yourselves and to ask questions in your chat box. And uh, Gabby will monitor the chat box while I'm talking, and then I will monitor the chat box for her while she's talking. And um, hold on just a minute. Just being sure this isn't somebody. Okay. I'll um, uh, get started with my part of the presentation, which is what to do with those bottle lambs that you didn't intend to have. And this always takes a minute to get your PowerPoint going right after you. There's the little arrows. There we go. So my part is called bottle lambs and kids. It's a good thing they're cute because sometimes they're a lot of work. So I need to just admit there's a, something blocking on my screen here. There we go. So why do we want to avoid bottle lambs and kids? For those of us that are trying to get the mothers to raise them, mostly because it's really time consuming getting them started. Usually if we have this type of bottle of lambs and kids, it's because there was a problem. They got chilled, the mother wouldn't take them, something. So it's gonna take a little fussing with them to get them going. And especially at the beginning, uh, you're trying to get them onto the milk replacer, make sure they got some colostrum. Sometimes you're just, they're with the mother, but you're supplementing them, trying to get the mother going. Whatever it is, it takes a lot of time and you can't, can't skip it because they have to eat. <clears throat> Once they're drinking well on their own, it's not nearly as bad. However, it does involve making milk replacer. That means you're gonna have this bag of powder and um, sitting around and uh, it can be kind of messy. So you wanna think about where you're gonna put it and where you're gonna keep it near in a place where you um, can wash up easily. And it's also an expense. Uh, if you were thinking this lamb was gonna be raised on the mother and now you have to feed it between the labor, the milk replacer and the time, it's really um, can be an expense. So <clears throat> let's talk about why we have bottle lambs in kids. Uh, a lot of times I find that it isn't what you might be thinking. A lot of times it's because they got put with the wrong mother and uh, if it's the wrong mother, whether she thinks it, it's all in the mother's eye, right? You may think the lamb belongs to her, but if she doesn't think it belongs to her or the baby goat to the doe, uh, they aren't gonna take it. So we'll, we will talk about fostering, but it is sometimes a challenge if you have a lot of animals uh, lambing at once or um, kidding at once, they sometimes get mixed up or you have uh, some that are grannies, which we'll talk about in a minute. Sometimes the mother just doesn't recognize the lamb as hers. She maybe had a lot of multiples and one of them got off, went off in the other direction, started trying to nurse on other sheep and she lost track of it. Sometimes you just have too many lambing close together in the barn 
and then suddenly you have, you know, you have a set of twins and a set of triplets and suddenly you have one you with four and one with one or something like that because they just got confused and it's hard to change their mind. Occasionally you have a mother that rejects her lambs. Uh, sometimes that happens with a first time mother. They're scared. They can't figure out what this is, where this little animal came from, or they're sore, or sometimes they act like they're mad. Um, we had one that was like overly attentive. So every time the lambs tried to nurse, she'd turn around and start licking the lambs. So they, they had a hard time nursing. And those I was able to supplement and hold the ewe and get her to figure out what she was supposed to do. But you need to pay attention to all those kind of things. Occasionally the mother is sick or injured or dies. I have had a predator, coyotes take a, a ewe and miraculously the little lambs <clears throat> survived and were hiding under a log right next to where her body was. Sometimes the mother um, maybe is sick or you know has a metabolic problem or is injured, her back legs are, are hurt or something. <clears throat> and occasionally we had a bad bout with listeria in our close-up ewes one year and we had lambs and lost some mothers uh, re really quickly. So it can happen, you can be left with some bottle lambs. Uh, sometimes they just have too many for their milk supply most ewes and does can easily raise two, but sometimes you have one uh, freshness with a blind quarter where they have three lambs and goats or maybe four. And I have had some that could easily raise three or four, but not all of them can. And um, you may find it's wise to pull one lamb and feed it yourself or try to foster it onto another. Um, there are granny ewes and I think um, there's a, I've never had this happen with goats, but I, I believe this could happen with goats as well. That's where a ewe that's very close to lambing <clears throat> is all turned on her hormones and she starts taking all the lambs that were just born. And I've come to the barn, seen a ewe there with three lambs. She's feeding them and pushing them with her nose and she's talking to them. And I look at her back end and I'm like, hmm, doesn't really look like you lambed. Then you gotta go around and try to find the mother and you're thinking, well, I'll just let her have them. She really wants them. And then uh, when she has her own lambs, she may reject those. So she could end up with five of her own, or she may reject the three that now can't go back to their original mother. So watch out for grannies. <clears throat> it's usually the same you every year. So we learn to watch out for her. Uh, sometimes it's wise to just get rid of these. Sometimes they're handy because you can foster onto them easier. And sometimes something happens to the lamb. It gets caught behind the feeder um, and the mother, you know, by the time you find it, the mother doesn't recognize it as hers or it got chilled and you had to take it away to save it. So there's lots of reasons for having bottle lambs. We try to avoid them. Also bottle kids, um, at least um, in a commercial situation like meat goats and uh, meat sheep. So this is what happens. Sometimes they get up in a box in your house because uh, the one on the left was born in that snowstorm last May. I had to bring her and her brothers and another set of twins back to the barn in a sled. Uh, and she was chilled. So I had to bring her in and uh, thaw her out. And neither of the mothers that lambed thought she was hers or she belonged to them. So uh, she's about a lamb. Her name is Tinkerbell. She's a little bit spoiled. And the one in the other box um, with a little coat on, he spent probably five days in my family room and um, he went through some tough times, wouldn't drink, couldn't drink, didn't feel good, kept getting cold, was hot, cold, eventually got him going. And, uh, but of course, by then his mother was, you know, she had other lambs and she didn't even recognize him as hers. So he was mine and he, but he was in a pen with a lot of other lambs. So he believes he's a sheep at least. So how do we avoid getting bottle lambs in kids? We try to have a lot of space. So um, when you're inside, you need to have enough room uh, so they aren't lambing on top of each other. It, it's especially bad. They seem to sort of lamb in spurts. We went last year, when four days before we thought we were going to start lambing, there were 11 lambs in the barn. And um, so we had a bunch of used lamb like all at once and then nothing until they were supposed to lamb again. So we don't really know why that was, but that's when you run into trouble when a whole lot of them lamb together at the same time. 
and they just get their lambs mixed up or they get them mixed up and there's one lamb left over. I've never, when we land outside, I've never had lambs get mixed up because they usually go off and lamb in under a bush or behind a log or over in the corner of the barn or over by the round bale. There just seems to be more space and they don't usually have problems. Um, watch out for obstacles. I mentioned the one behind the feeder. There's always places in the barn the lamb can manage to get stuck. Or we have some that just, they lay down at the back edge of the barn and they somehow fall out underneath the barn and end up behind the barn. I don't even know how they do it, but these things can happen. So you need to really look around closely when you're lambing and kidding and also try to, um, you know, get rid of some of those obstacles if you can. And you need to watch closely, like when you're, if you are putting your animals in pens or jugs, is what we call the pens we put newborn lambs in. And you're just assuming that this lamb is with this mother and these are with that one and these look like the other ones and these two look the same, so they go together. You can't really make those assumptions. I mean, it's a good place to start. You have to kind of put them in the pens and then pay close attention um, because sometimes they fool you. And if they aren't with the right mother, the mother will um, not take them and she could even hurt them. And then there's just preventive basics of having minerals and nutrition, everything right so the lambs are strong when they're born. And I'm gonna uh, try something. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. I have found a little video on my Facebook. I can find it on here. Uh, oops. So I have to, if this is going to work or not, you try it. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I have a great video. Uh, and it's, on, it's in my, um, I don't know if I can get to it is all. Now I lost my PowerPoint. Okay. Hang on a minute. I got to open the PowerPoint again. I had a great video of when we let all the lambs out of the jug and it's all the mothers uh, finding them and the ones that they don't want. And okay, so let me just stop sharing a minute and then share again. I was afraid of that. I probably should have opened um, several versions of Chrome and then it might've worked okay. Uh, let's see. I need the slideshow here, people. See, I'm just waiting for the little thing at the top to go away so I can get it into slideshow mode. Go back down here to avoiding lamps. Okay, come on, I wanna do a slideshow. There we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry, thought I had this great video. If I can find it uh, later, I'll put it back up. So let's talk about fostering. Fostering is, you know, trying to give a lamb to you and getting her to take it. A, you, that, a lamb that she doesn't believe is hers, whether you do or not. And um, I find it very challenging. Some people are really good at it. Some people are uh, maybe more convincing <laughs> than I am or something, but I have had instances where I've fostered a lamb on and the mother is feeding it, but she's not really mothering it. So in our case, the lambs are on pasture with their mothers. And if they don't have somebody actually mothering them, they don't really do that well out on the pasture. So even though she took the lamb, it might not do too well. So you need to think about that. Some ewes are really hard to convince. Some are a little easier. And a lot of it is timing. Like if you have two ewes or does that just kitted or lambed, and one of them's got one and one of them's got three, you can often just put one of the three in with the one and rub them together. And she's just in the mood to take lambs or kids and it'll work. But um, when it's not right at birth, it can be a real challenge. I'm gonna show you some methods here. So first you can try to fool the ewe by skinning it. Like if you have a dead lamb, you can skid the dead lamb and, and put it over the new lamb and put it in with the mother. Sometimes you can fool her. Or sometimes you can just coat it with the afterbirth. Um, and there is something called vaginal stimulation down here on the bottom. If I can get the little pointer here. Here's the person, um, they're reaching in as if they're untangling a lamb. 
And this ewe is just lambing, so they're stimulating her by putting their hand in her uh, vagina. And then they're going to hand her another lamb. And the idea is well, hopefully we've um, fooled her into thinking she had another lamb. And it actually works pretty good with goats. I have had luck doing that with goats. Uh, mostly I was doing meat goats, but um, they were fairly easy to convince. You can also try to force the ewe or doe by putting them in a stanchion, like a little pen with a stanchion. And there's some examples over here on the right. Uh, up here in the corner, you see this one has a little spot where the lamb can get away from the ewe so that she doesn't get stepped on. Uh, this one has a head stanchion and a spot where the lamb can get underneath. And you feed the ewe something to distract her. And here's a U and a stanchion. I think this is one from Premier, maybe, or maybe Seidel. And the lamb is in the pen, but the U can't really get her with her head. But she can. What happens to me when I try to do this is the U just jumps all around in the back end and steps all over the lamb. So it would only work with a lamb that's already pretty strong and knows how to nurse. I have better luck uh, with them in the jug. Like sometimes you got a mother that likes two of her lambs, but the other one not so much. And I will hold under with one hand under her chin and back my back end around and push her up against the wall and then reach down with my other hand and stick the lamb on and just kind of distract the ewe and let the lamb drink. Um, I've also done that with goats. It's a little trickier because the udder's generally bigger and hopefully if the, if the uh, kid is able to nurse off the dough easily, it can work. So after you hold them, you know, you have to go in there three, four times a day and hold them so it's not necessarily less work than feeding them, but you can sometimes get that to work after a while. They just get tired of you coming in and holding them and they put up with it. Um, so those are some of the ways I have seen people try to use hobbles. Um, the stanchion is sort of the classic. Again, timing is important. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you, if you end up with a bottle lamb, or kid, and I said, or 10, because it seems like some years we have a whole bunch and some years we only have one or two. And I have had years where I've had none, none, which is nice also. You need to remember they're babies. So they're just like people, babies. They eat frequently, they sleep, they poop, they, pay, they play a little bit, they like to get a little of attention and, and it repeats. So that means you're probably gonna be carrying this lamb or baby goat around in a box or a clothes basket with you. Sometimes they go to the grocery store with me in the back of the car because I'm going on to work or something. Um, or you have a, a handy spot. If you have a nice pen in the barn where you can put them that's protected and clean, that's good too if it's somewhere you can get to during the day. And we mostly start them on the bottle. And I'm gonna show you pictures of some good bottles and nipples to use as well. It's really important that they get some colostrum Colostrum is that first milk out of the teats, and it's it's there for probably a day, day and a half, but it get, goes down in quality as you go over time. And so the first colostrum is really important. However, in, at least in the case of sheep and also in goats, I've had this too when I've milked the goats by hand. There's It's very thick. Sometimes it's almost like uh, milking out butter. You know, It just sits in a glob in the bottom of the cup. And that's pretty hard to put into a bottle and feed to a lamb or a kid. So if you get as much as you can, usually if you keep milking, you'll get to some more liquidy stuff. And if you can't, um, you can uh, milk, mix up a little warm milk replacer, put that little bit of colostrum in there and stir it up, uh, break it up good, and you can feed that and they'll at least get the colostrum into them. And that usually sort of makes them come to life. It's almost like, it's like you gave them a drug. <laughs> kind of amazing. So um, don't forget the colostrum. Um, Gabby's gonna talk about amounts of colostrum and that sort of thing. But it, any, any colostrum is better than no colostrum. When our goats, last year we were smart and our goats freshened before our sheep and I saved colostrum in little Ziploc bags in the freezer and I could throw them into a bucket of warm water and then cut the corner off and, or just pour them into the, uh, with a little funnel into a bottle and the gold colostrum worked pretty good on lambs. It also worked good on baby goats when we needed it. So if you have a high producing, I, I've never gotten that much colostrum out of a sheep that I could freeze it, but I haven't tried that hard. Um, if you have a good producer and you could even get you know, a couple ice cubes worth, it would be, 
be worth it to have because that could save a lamb. Um, if you have goats, usually there's a little more volume there and you can you know, let the lambs drink or the kids drink and then go back and uh, milk out some colostrum and save a little bit for next year or for later in lambing or kidding. There is artificial colostrum and it has really improved. There's even some milk replacers that have the colostrum in them. So read, read your labels carefully, but the artificial colostrums uh, are better than nothing also. Those are usually available at the feed store uh, if you can find them. I tend not to use cow colostrum or cow's milk because of the potential of yonis. Um, there is sheep yonis and goat yonis, but it's more common in dairy cows and you don't want that in your flock. So these are babies and they need, you know, you can rub them all over with a towel when they're first, if they're still wet or even between feedings, I scratch them on the chest or I tickle their butt, something that'll sometimes get them eating a little better. And some of them, if they've had a rough start, some of them take quite a while to get going and it, it, you just have to keep fiddling with them and trying to convince them they're hungry and that they want to live. And um, some, some boy, they get a little bit of colostrum and they take off and then they just, you're it because they think you're going to feed them and you are going to feed them, but uh, they soon, they figure that out. It's like they imprint on you. So let's talk about now that you've got them off the bottle, which we usually do for a day or two, depending on how strong they are. Uh, once they're able to drink out of the bottle easily, then we can get them onto a bigger feeder. So there's buckets. We're going to look at pictures of all of these, by the way. There's buckets with nipples towards the bottom so that, you know, as the milk goes down, the TV all goes right to the nipples. There's buckets with the nipples that are near the top and they have clear tubing that goes down into the milk. Um, there's lamb, what we call a lamb bar or kid bar that has a whole row of nipples on the bottom. And there's automatic feeders as well. So let's take a look at some here. Well, here's one. This is a uh, Premier, has, that one actually only has six nipples on it and I think there's eight lambs there. So. What's the problem here? Well, we need one more feeder, right? So that they aren't competing so hard. You will notice that those, this little lamb here, even though he's the littlest one, he's got the nipple in his mouth. So um, he's doing pretty well, but I don't think that's a great way to feed lambs. You really need another another bucket. But you can see that they can, once you teach them how to drink off of there, which means you got to go in there, push them up to the feeder while they're pushing backwards and open their mouth and stick it on the nipple so they figure out, because that nipple is not the same as the one we use on the bottle, so that they figure out how to um, actually suck on there. So here's some things to think about when you're getting a feeder. How easy is it to clean? Because it's really important that you clean it, and if it's difficult, nobody's going to want to do it. So does it come apart easily? Does it fit in the sink? And you'll see some of the pictures I show you. It's really hard to wash something if you can't get it in the sink. Now, when the weather's nice, you can use the hose outside, but it's, that if you're lambing in February, that doesn't work so well, at least not around here. And do you need certain things to clean it? Like, do you need a little brush to get in the nipples, or do you need a wrench to open, take things off, or what do you need to make it work? And how many lambs or kids are you feeding? If you're only feeding one or two, you, know, you may just keep them right on the bottle. And I also try to think about, can I get the parts? Because there's almost no place locally that sells uh, lamb nipples that would fit a, a feeder that you ordered in the mail and there's almost no place that actually sells a lamb feeder for that matter and think about where it'll be used is it going to hang over a railing or like a pen or is it going to be mounted on the wall or does it have a stand how is it how does that work and how will it work in your situation so let's look at some this is called a Pritchard Teat and I'm not uh, promoting Dr. Pepper except I really like their bottles so when it gets to be lambing season, I always have to buy a six pack of Dr. Pepper and share it with everybody so I can have some clean bottles to use. And um, the Pritchard Teat is, is nice, especially nice for goats because it's long and thin and it fits in a baby goat's mouth pretty easily, even a small one. And this little hole has a BB inside it. And so air, when you've got the bottle tipped up and they're sucking, air actually goes up into that little hole so that it doesn't make suck make a vacuum in there and um, the little BB keeps the milk from coming out. So those, that's called a Pritchard Teat. There are some other versions. Um, I really like these. You can order them in the mail. I think our local feed store does carry them. And I have seen them at Tractor Supply as well. 
this is what we refer to at the extension farm as the mayonnaise jar feeder. So if you only have one lamb and you just want to have to clean one smaller thing, this will hold like a quart of a milk replacer. And this is a more generic nipple and it usually has a rubber band around here because they'll suck that right off of there. And it fits in this little wire holder. You can kind of handy, you can hang it almost anywhere. Um, not very expensive. So if you just have one odd one, or you think you might only have one, or you need to supplement one. I sometimes use it as a supplement. Uh, that's pretty handy. And um, this is the Premier Square Bucket with uh, the little, those little um, nipple holders screw on to a piece that's on the inside of the bucket that has a little um, like straw that goes down into the mill, right to the bottom of the bucket so that they can get it all out. And it has a cover, which I like. Uh, this one's hanging on the pen. And uh, that's only a two holer. They, you can have two, four, or six. And I wanted to talk about where you put your lamb feeder. This one is inside our creep feeder. That that little thing that looks like jail there on the end. That's um, those are little rollers, and the lambs can squeeze through there, but the sheep can't. So only the lambs can get in there. It's called the creep feeder, and we give them uh, grain in there. You can't see them. They're off to the right there with their heads in the grain feeder. But we put our, our milk feeder here and hung it up because I had it hanging over on this side, over, over on that uh, side of the pen. But there was a ewe that every night would lay down there and she'd rub up against the thing. And, the, and then when she stood up, it would catch in her wool and she'd either flip it off the handle, she'd flip it sideways, she'd get it all dirty. It just wasn't working. I couldn't seem to convince her to lay somewhere else. So I actually put that in the creep feeder. You can, some other things you have to watch it. Some people's cats uh, come in and chew the ends off the nipple. I've never had that happen. I shouldn't even say that out loud probably, but don't normally have that happen. Occasionally you get a, a lamb that doesn't need milk replacer that figures out that there's a little treat in there and they'll be a little pig. Most of the time they don't like milk replacer if they're getting mom's milk, but you never know. And I've never really had trouble with the ewes drinking off it, but sometimes that can happen as well. So if you've got a little pen where they can get in and out or if your bottle lambs are just in a separate pen, that works well. There's Tinkerbell again. I just put this in to show that there's uh, another type of nipple. You see this, these, oops, let me go one more here. These are latex um, rubber. And this is a red rubber nipple and it's a little bit tougher because when they get bigger and they're sucking on that thing, they're really hard on it. So here's some other kinds. I I've, I've, haven't used these, but I have seen them in use. So this looks really handy if you had a bunch of animals, but you couldn't carry it if it was full of milk. So you must have to use it and then take it away when it's empty and wash it and then bring it back and hang it up again and then bring the milk to it in a bucket or something because uh, it has enough spots for 10, which is nice if you've got a lot of them, like if you have a goat dairy and you're trying to feed them. It does not have a cover, which I don't like to see because flies get in there and things. The other problem I see with this is, will it fit in your sink to wash it? It might if you have one of those big dairy sinks, you know, long, the long uh, half rounded uh, stainless steel dairy sinks might work. Or if you have a um, sink with a little hose on the faucet so you could wash out in there. But you can always put soapy water in there and squirt it through the nipples. You don't really have to take the nipples off every time and then rinse it, put clean water in, squirt that through each nipple, dump it out, clean the outside, dry the outside. I usually try to dry them so they stay clean. Um, so it, this could be useful if in the right situation. And here's a slightly smaller version that hooks over the uh, edge of a gate or something. And here's a, a, a one lamb version of this as well. I just found these online by Googling lamb milk replacer feeders, by the way. And there's different companies that carry them. I didn't put the companies underneath there. I've used this white one with baby dairy goats. So there's little black nipples sticking out in each of these places. It's a little hard to see with this background. There's one you can see. And they just fit in a hole in the bucket. And then there's a clear tube that goes down into the bottom of the bucket. And it's in this nice metal stand and it sits right on the ground. So I can pour the milk in there, put the cover on, and the baby goats, sometimes I prime the nipples at the beginning so they learn that that's where the milk is. And they'll go right to town. I don't have much trouble with them knocking it over. Uh, if there's more, if there's only one, it might be a problem, but um, usually it works out okay. 
it's not too bad to clean. You can take those off pretty easily or just uh, run, you know, squirt some soapy water through them because that bucket lifts right out of that metal frame. And it's not actually a very big bucket. So these are some others I found online. That you can get these from Premier. At least you don't have to stand there and hold the bottle. I just don't like washing the bottles. And because to get them really clean, you really need to use a bottle brush and do a good job. Um, but if you only have a couple and it's fun, if you've got kids, they might really enjoy this. Uh, I know our kids at the extension farm that stop in and come to the after school program, even in the little holders, they'll stand there and hold the bottle and they get a big kick out of it. And this one, I'm not sure, that looks like a lot of work to me. It's cute and it's clever, but it's a lot of bottles. And this one, um, this one looks like it could get a lot of dirt inside it into the milk. And then I don't know how you clean it if you that this piece comes off. Uh, it is individual, so if you're watching them drink, you might be able to see how much they each one is drinking, although I'm guessing they move around some. But you wouldn't want to leave this sitting out like this because I know in our case, they run by and they kick stuff up into the feeders and things, so it would be dirty. And this one, I thought this was pretty clever, actually. Somebody made little dividers because if you've ever watched them drink, they... First of all, they have a favorite nipple that they all want to nurse on, and then they also do the thing like they do at the feeder where they keep moving down thinking there's something better in the next one. So this was, um, I don't know how many that is, but it's sort of like that red feeder we looked at a minute ago, but they made dividers so that the lambs or kids could only drink off that spot. So let's talk a little bit about milk replacer. Gabby will talk some more about milk replacer in a couple minutes. Um, if you're feeding lambs, it really should be sheep milk replacer. If you're feeding goats, it really should be goat milk replacer. And um, in the case of sheep milk replacer, it needs to be at least 25% protein and 30% fat. That's what it says in the um, literature that I looked up, but I will tell you that none of the milk replacers I looked at actually have 25% protein, but they all have 30% fat. So apparently sheep need a higher fat to protein ratio than some of the other species and sheep, of course, can have copper. So you need to be a little careful. You can't really feed, you can feed goat's milk to sheep, but you can't feed goat milk replacer. Um, should be high quality. Like when, when you mix it up in the bowl and you pour the milk out, you shouldn't have like nuts and bolts in the bottom or too many insect parts and that kind of thing. You want something clean. These are babies you're feeding. Um, and some of them have preservatives. They're either acidified, the whole thing is acidified, or they have a little bit of preservative in the fat because that's what spoils. It does go rancid if you don't uh, store it in a cool, dry place. And it should be easy mixing. And I, lately, all the milk replacers I've tried have been easy mixing. They used to be horrible. It was like mixing up globs of butter and white powder and flour and water, and it was terrible. But um, now they seem to have gotten the method down, and they're really great. So, But it is an important thing for the person making the milk replacer. And I mentioned colostrum before. I want to make sure they get some colostrum. And you can buy artificial colostrum. Some of the milk placers do have the colostrum right in them. So what about goat's milk or cow's milk? I've tried to raise uh, lambs on cow's milk. It's OK once they're a little bigger. Or sometimes you can make up for the lack of uh, denseness of the cow's milk by feeding more of it. Same with goat's milk. Uh, we've often just milked our goats and we don't drink the milk, so we, we can't drink the milk. So we pour it into our uh, lamb feeders and they just drink so much they look like little barrels with legs all morning till they deflate a little. And uh, so they're getting plenty of nutrients, even though it's not very dense. Uh, it does make for a very wet pen because then they do uh, pee out all that extra water. So you can, I would say goat's milk would be better than cow's milk. And of course, sheep milk is the best, and sheep milk replacer is probably the next best for sheep. For goats, you can feed goat's milk. Like if you have a goat dairy, you may want to try to pasteurize it first if you're trying to get rid of different diseases. But um, certainly, if you can afford to spare the goat's milk, they'll do well on that. Let's take a quick look at um, our lamb milk replacer. This is the one we're feeding at the moment. We just happen to have a few bottle lambs. We had some oopsie lambs born over Valentine's Day weekend when it was really cold, like minus 19, and they needed a little help. And I ended up with a few bottle lambs, um, mostly our fault, I would say. 
So this is called Save a Lamb. We'll look at two different ones that I have here. So this is what it looks like on the back. And I must say they really improved their writing on the back of the milk replacer bags because it used to say, it was very industrial, you know, five pounds of milk replacer for this much milk at this temperature. And it didn't really give you any hint of what the little cup inside the bag was, how much that weighed or, or uh, how to use it. So this has a lot better instructions. And it also mentions that they should receive colostrum uh, before they get milk replacer preferably early on. So they've obviously taken a little time to write some better instructions. But if you look at the analysis, uh, let's see here, it's 23% protein and 30% fat. So it is a little lower in protein than what I saw recommended, but they all seem to be about in that level. And it has whey, whey protein concentrate, dried whey products, dried skim milk. Whey is a byproduct of cheese, right, from real milk. So that's all real, real animal protein products, animal fat, which is preserved, and lecithin, which is a, um, oh, helps the fat go into solution, emulsifier, and a little dextrose, which is sweet, and then it's got all kinds of um, vitamins, minerals, and that sort of thing, all balanced for you, which is great. And it does mention you should store it in a cool, dry place, and I'll talk about that again in a minute. And I'm gonna, let's see, here's the instructions. So it tells you, basically they max out at around two cups of milk replacer and four cups of water. And what we do at the extension farm, we have two bottle lamps, so we mix four cups of replacer with four cups of hot water. We mix it up good, and then we add four cups of cold water or cool water at least. Um, and that there it's good for the day. And we put that in one of those feeders. If they drink it all in the morning, they don't get any more till the next morning. Uh, you can divide it up and feed it twice a day. That's okay, but this is really easy. And they do show here um, that basically the ratio is one part powder to two parts water by volume. And almost all the milk replacers fall in that, right in that range. So the little cup in there, you know, you can use, the cup is supposed to weigh four ounces. And I, I really wanted to weigh some. I had to go out of town just before the program and I didn't get to, um, Put the cup on the scale to show that it weighs four ounces, but I'm I'm going to check it out tomorrow when I get to work, and um, see how close it is. And I think the important thing is that you're consistent. So you expect a lamb. If you look down here, so the total they're going to eat during the day is three to four cups of milk replacer, and I we sort of get ours right up to four cups per day, and um, that's four cups of mixed milk replacer, by the way. So two cups of powder or four cups of water that goes into four cups of water. Uh, and we don't go up and down this much. We just give them that the whole time. And we sort of hope they start eating grain. We don't sort of hope we watch them and make sure they eat grain. And it mentions down here, provide fresh, clean water at all times. So you gotta have a little bucket in there okay, for them. So they learn to, they usually watch the mothers and learn to drink. But if you have true bottle babies and they're not with other sheep, you might want to get them so they learn to drink out of a bucket. And then a, a good quality grain and also your best hay usually, because they aren't really ruminants yet. So they really need to be on a grain and milk replacer diet. But as their rumen develops, you want them to have high quality feed. So here's a few hints. Use the scoop that comes with the replacer. Two to one, so technically you could use anything as long as you kept the ratio right. Try to be consistent. Um, some people always have their finger in the cup while they're measuring it out. Some people don't. You can use a whisk. If you only have a few, a whisk works good. If you're making big batches, sometimes uh, you can get like a big whisk that goes on your drill. Saves a lot of wear and tear on your wrist. You do need to remember to charge the drill batteries. Unfortunately, I speak from experience there. Uh, you try not to incorporate too much air. Like I, I like to get it really mixed well, but if you get a whole lot of air in there, that sometimes is hard on the baby's stomach. I just figure most of the time, by the time I pour it in the feeder, do a few other things and carry it out there, a lot of that air has come out. But I have seen, you know, sometimes they do bloat, so we try not to get any extra air in there. So we always start with the warm water to mix it and then add cold. Um, the next replacer I'm gonna show you actually says to mix with cold water. I wouldn't feed cold milk replacer to a brand new lamb that you're trying to get on to milk replacer, but certainly after they're going, they don't really even seem to mind. Uh, they sometimes drink a whole lot and then shiver a little bit and they just keep going. So 
uh, if it's minus 20 out, I'm not sure I would feed them cold milk replacer, but if it's a uh, reasonable temperature, it, it certainly lasts longer if you put it out there cold. I mean, in terms of it doesn't spoil, not in terms of they won't eat it. Um, if you're making big amounts, I mentioned you might want to do it by weight or use bigger cups. I know when you, we had a whole lot of lambs, and I was measuring like 24 cups of milk replacer and then 48 cups of water. It gets really hard because if somebody talks to you for a minute and you lose count, you're in a mess. So we, you know, when we're doing a lot of them, we use a bigger, a bigger measurement. Uh, calf bottles work pretty good because they hold, what, two quarts or something. We used to use those to measure as well. And some of the bowls have uh, measuring on them as well. Here's another milk replacer called Nutristart. I've used this too. Again, 23% protein, 30% fat. This one has mostly, it has all animal protein. It does have a little vegetable fat. You know, as long as it's uh, below a certain amount, it shouldn't bother them too much and it's kept fresh. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty similar. It has the same start sort of uh, mixing instructions. Not quite as easy for somebody mixing it up for a couple because it says two pounds of powder per gallon of water. And you might be only wanting to mix a pint. Here it says four ounces by weight of powder with one pint of water, I'm sorry, four ounces of powder with one pint of water, but it doesn't tell you that the cup inside there weighs four ounces. And so that's a little deceiving or a little confusing when you're trying to figure this out in the barn. So some other things I mentioned, they should have water available. Um, you should try to start them on a really good sheep lamb grain or in the case of goats and a goat grain uh, would have the right minerals for them. Usually you go for like a high energy 16% or something like that. Could be a pellet, could be a mash. Um, we start it in the creep feeder or if, if they go to weaning without grain, which they do when they're out on pasture, we then start them very slowly on the grain. But if, if you can get your bottle lambs onto grain early, you can actually wean them early. We'll talk about that in a minute. Should try to put similar size lambs together. So we lamb some in February. When we lamb in April, we won't want to be putting those little bottle lambs in with the big bottle lambs because they won't get much to eat with the big bottle lambs in there. So we'll have to have two pens if that happens. Now, actually, by then we should be able to wean our February lambs. But anyways, you wouldn't want to mix too, too many different sizes together. And sometimes that happens when you get some triplets and they're relatively small with some big ones. So, you know, just pay attention and, and watch when they're eating and be sure they're all getting to eat. So when you get towards the end and you're going to wean the lambs or the kids, you want to either use up the milk replacer or you need to keep it in the fridge or freezer. So if I, I usually save a little at the end, so I have it at the beginning of the next lambing season if I need it, or if there's some of those surprise lambs in February. And I, if it's in plastic, it's great. I roll the bag up real tight, tape it shut, put it in the bottom of my barn fridge. If you can fit it in the freezer, that's even better. So keep it cold and out of the light, and it'll keep really well, actually. And it's not as nice as fresh, but when you've got a lamb born late at night and you can't get to the feed store or they don't have lamb milk replacer yet that time of year, it's nice to have that little bit of milk replacer. And I even sometimes put some in a, like a plastic container and put it in my freezer just so I have it handy. Everybody's always looking through the freezer wondering what the heck it is. But there are some lamb kid problems you can run into when you're feeding bottle lambs. Occasionally you have one that bloats, usually more than once if they have that tendency. Um, a little mylanta in the drench gun or a little drench syringe uh, or a little cymethicone right in their milk will help. Got to kind of pat their sides and just like a regular baby and give them to burp it out. What happens is they get foam in there and then it's not easy to burp out. And, and the uh, if they get too bloated, it'll put too much pressure on their lungs and they won't be able to breathe. So it's important to get the bloat out of there. Uh, those are not labeled for lambs, by the way. So you didn't hear it from me, but those, both of those things will work. They both have cymethicone. Sometimes you have a lamb that just won't suck or they'll drink, drink, and then they just seem to go downhill. And it's probably true that it doesn't feel good or it's, even though it seems like it's okay, it probably doesn't feel good or it might even be slightly chilled because they can feel warm, but if you stick your finger in their mouth, you can tell if they're really warm, feel their feet, they should feel warm. So. Uh, sometimes you need to warm them up a little. That one that I had in the box, I finally treated that one. I um, talked to the vet and she suggested I give her a little antibiotics 
for a couple of days and and that did the trick seemed to be maybe he really wasn't feeling that well even though he looked okay and actually his temperature was cold and then warm and then cold so he was having a hard time getting started sometimes you can just try a different nipple or a different temperature of the milk replacer or a little different routine to get them to drink and you normally have to put the nipple in their mouth open their mouth slide the nipple in and sort of hold your hand under their chin to support their head like once they get going uh, you can just wave the nipple in their direction usually and they'll grab on but uh, at the beginning you need to help them out i put tickle their butts if you notice a mother you um nursing her baby she she keeps like licking their rear end or pushing them with her nose so helps sometimes if you can do that sometimes just rubbing them all over kind of gets them stimulated and they start looking for something to eat when I say feed them under something, uh, I had one lamb that would only drink at the feeder if my hand was above her head. Um, I don't know if that's because it was more like reaching under the mother. Sometimes I do it with like between my knees, bending over, feeding the lamb uh, sort of behind my knees. That seems to just, whatever you can do to get them started. And sometimes you just have to keep fooling around. So where are you gonna keep your bottle lambs and kids? You're gonna keep them like on the left here, these are out in the barn. There's sheep on the other side. They kind of learn to be sheep while they're out there, even though they're sort of attached to you. And that's good if you want to keep these or sell them to people for breeding animals. You want them to know how to act like sheep or goats. Those are hair sheep, by the way. That's why they kind of look like goats or sheep. This kind of thing can happen, so you need to keep an eye on them. That's probably Tinkerbell. And uh, they can get upside down in something. And I put that in there because I've seen people with a five gallon pail, a tall, thin five gallon pail in with their lambs because maybe there's other sheep in there drinking out of it. Well, a lamb can get in there and can't get out and can drown. So uh, we recommend using either the wider water pail, I would think it was sort of a classic water pail because they can climb out of those easier or a small bucket. Uh, and just, once they get in something like this, they can't get out, although they can make a lot of noise so that you come and get them out. And you can also keep them uh, in other places, like a dog kennel. We used to have two lambs, and they'd be in here. And my when my kids were little, they'd let them out, run around the yard with them. That's great, except that they think they're people when you're done. So if you can keep them in the barn, that's better. Uh, but it certainly is fun to have them, you know, in your backyard or someplace handy. So let's talk about weaning. Now you're done feeding them. Um, let's talk about weaning. So traditionally, we feed them for about eight weeks. Uh, they're usually eating grain then easily and drinking water. It is a long time. You really don't have to feed them that long. You can wean them. I saw two different studies. One was 24 days, one was 28 days. And uh, both cases, they had a very high quality grain. And you can actually get that um, grain recipe from the Cornell uh, website under, if you go down under management and click on feeding. So they're actually under there and uh, they need to be drinking water. So if you could stop feeding them at four weeks, that's like half as much milk replacer and half as much time. So um, I imagine on the big, if you had a big situation where you're feeding a lot of them, it would certainly make sense to try to wean them early. And that's what they do at Cornell. They have, they're milking their sheep and they, they feed the lambs and then they uh, wean them at, at uh, 28 days. So how do you wean them? Do you just, take the stuff away? Do you decrease the amount slowly? Well, if you decrease the amounts, the big lambs are gonna just hog it all. So that doesn't always work. You can dilute it out or just put water in the feeder. We generally, since we usually feed them till they're eight weeks old, we usually just take it away and they're a little mad for a day or two, but they already know how to drink and eat. And pretty soon they're just eating the grain and they might blat at you when you come in the barn, but they don't really seem to be suffering much. And just some, uh, there was a nice budget Dr. Tony at Cornell shared with us um, for weaning at 28 days. So this is a lamb or kid that was born at say seven to 10 pounds and put on 18 pounds over the first 28 days. So pretty good rate of gain over half a pound a day. Uh, they were feeding milk placer. It did not give the cost of the bag milk placer, but it said it took two to three dollars worth of milk placer per pound of gain up to weaning. And then they fed them uh, up to 100 pounds, and that took another 200 and some pounds of grain. And they used the price 320 a ton. That was $139 total. And so, if you could sell a 100-pound lamb, if you can get more than you know 
a dollar thirty or a dollar forty per pound, uh, you should come out ahead, even though you had to feed the lamb at the beginning. Now, if you had to add on more cost for milk replacer, that's going to up that total cost, and um, you may or may not want to. You may, you know, some people like to sell their their bottle lamps to somebody else to raise or give them away because they don't like to take care of them. But it could, it can be profitable if you uh, approach it correctly, and if that's your goal. I mean. At, at the extension farm, we enjoy the bottle lambs and the students that come enjoy them because they're friendly. And so we don't mind having them around. We have uh, probably more help than most people. But we have a lot of help during the week when there's schools in session, but we don't have a lot on the weekend or whenever schools uh, break. But um, we don't mind feeding them a little longer and it, it does cost a little more, but there are other benefits. So in conclusion, if you have bottle lambs and kids, it does take patience. Uh, to get them started, um, sometimes you feel like you just can't get them going, but usually if you're persistent, you'll be successful. And, and you won't save all of them, I should say. You know, I say you can save them all, but you can't really always save them. Sometimes something's wrong with them on the inside or something. Um, use a system that works for you. If you have one or two and you want to baby them, that's great. If you have a lot of them and you want to decrease your labor, there's ways to do that too. Find a really good quality grain or creep feed. We have ours made custom made at White and Patterson in Canton. Other companies will make you a, a custom mix. You can also buy some pretty nice, nicely formulated lamb grains um, and also goat grains. And when you put the feeder in and you're feeding them, really you should watch them because you can see a lot about how vigorously they drink, uh, how they feel after they drink, uh, if they drink. So I always say don't put the feeder in and walk away. Put the feeder in and pay attention for a little while. It's kind of fun to watch them anyways. And then once you have these lambs and they're grown up, do you sell them or do you add them to your flock? Well, we had a really spoiled hair lamb at the extension farm. The BOCI students took her in the classroom. She got to sleep in the beanbag chair when she was little. And she really, I was really worried that she wouldn't know she was a sheep. And she had twins this spring and she took just fine care of them. So. Luckily, those instincts usually kick in. It doesn't seem to affect their ability to care for their own young. They can be a nuisance if, if they're too friendly and you're trying to herd the flock around, like doing rotational grazing, and they keep standing in the way or deciding they want to go back to the barn and visit with people, or they want to knock your screen door down and come out in the kitchen while you're making dinner. So you have to decide um, you know, what works in your situation. But um, we generally sell, like we have a bunch of bottle lambs, we'll sell them to somebody starting a flock because then they have a group of friendly sheep to start with. I think that's all what I have. I'm gonna stop the sharing here so, so I can see the chat. Are we have questions? I kind of like to find that um, video to show you of the use um, if I can find it now that we're off here. And if anyone has any questions for Betsy now, you can unmute yourselves too and ask. Um, but if not, we can wait until the end of my presentation to go and ask. Okay, let me come back a minute. I'm just gonna show you this. I think I can share it now. I know I couldn't do this before, but okay, I don't I have to see if the video works for you guys. Oops. So these were lambs that we just let out of the jug. You can see the mother's looking for their lambs. Whoops, that one does not like that lamb. And they do find each other by calling. They're kind of looking all over to find their lambs. So <laughs> those are obviously not newborns. But I just thought it was interesting to see how they um, See how they sniff the lambs and look at them and talk to them. It can be pretty noisy. And pretty entertaining. Okay, there you go. There was actually another thing in here. If I can get it. Oops, darn. Well, let me get to it. I, I had pulled up the uh, premiere page to show as well. Okay, a question. I see there's a question about feeding grain. 
Yes, hi, thank you. I, I you started my video. Yeah, I, here I am. I was eating dinner and I didn't think anybody needed to see that. So um, thank you for this uh, presentation. I have a bunch of bottle lambs. I usually do um, because I raise fin sheep and um, get a lot of multiples. And my practice is to leave them with the dams um, and to supplement as needed. Um, the, sometimes some in the larger litters will um, do like half and half and you know nursing and supplementation. Yep. Some will just get trained to come to the bottle and just come to me, but they still stay in their family group. Um, I've and, done that. I've done that too. That can work really well, actually. Yeah, because sometimes they'll actually get strong enough so they can get enough milk off the mother. Too. Or they sometimes start stealing from somebody else too. <laughs> that, that too. <laughs> that happens too. Um, but I don't feed grain um, except during gestation and lactation, yep. and then once the lambs. So I lamb in March. So I just finished and we'll go out on pasture probably the first week in May, which is generally when I stop feeding everybody. Um, and I don't feed lambs grain in a creep feeder. And I'm wondering if that's a problem. You, you, you're stressing to, um, you can wean early. I, I'm always wondering when is the right time to wean because um, they would nurse forever and drink bottles forever if I would let them. Okay, so, so you're, you're on a pasture system though, which is a little different. When, when we lamb in April and go into pasture, there's no creep feeder for the lambs. But the ones that if I bring in bottle lambs and I'm feeding them inside, then I would definitely make sure they had grain. So, and not just hay. I mean, they're in a, they're in a paddock now. They won't be on pasture for another month. So you're saying once the lambs, they have access to hay, second cut hay all the time. And then when they go on pasture, um, obviously they have access to grass all the time. It's right. okay for them not to have grain at all. Most of them are getting some kind of milk, right? Either from the mother or from your bottle. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah it's I'm okay. bottle feeding four times a day. <laughs> so. You won't be able to, you probably wouldn't be able to get them to eat grain. I've tried to do creep feeding on pasture and it's, some of them they'll take to it. Like when the ewes all come in and lay down, uh, if they're in that situation where they can get back to the barn to lay down out of the sun or something, the lambs will sometimes use the creep feeder, but not really. Is it okay for until they go on pasture not to offer them grain for the bottle lambs? Yeah, they just won't maybe not grow as fast. But if they're only a few weeks old, they're not going to eat much grain anyways. I mean, it's okay. more a matter of getting them started on the grain so that when you do want to wean them, they're eating. Okay, yeah. And they steal out of their mother's dishes, but I just... Um... Well, that works too. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I, I see a question here about uh, joint ill. And that might just be, a, uh, she's saying they never have trouble with you raised lambs, but always seem to get a couple or a few suffering from joint ill on bottle raised lambs. That's something that enters through the umbilical. So I don't know if it's, um, you know, it doesn't even have to really be what I would call dirty, just that it's a bacteria. So they could have picked it up anywhere and they maybe weren't cleaned as well as babies because they were rejected or. Um, yeah, I was thinking like it up. It, maybe they're, uh, adding, if you're not already doing it already, dipping navels with iodine. Um, the problem is, that if they're like me, I find a lot of them already dry. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where it, it sounds good to go and be like, yeah, it's a good protocol. I'm going to go and do it, but sometimes it's just not always practical. Right. And it might be where they're housed or, you know, if you got them all in a pen and Bottle lambs tend to be wet because they drink a lot and then they pee a lot, um, as are the pens where you have lactating ewes. Um, so I guess the best thing is, you know, as clean as possible. Uh, as Gabby said, dip the navels if you can. You don't really know which ones are going to be bottle lambs till they're bottle lambs, but um, and really watch for it so you can treat it before it gets bad because it is hard to get rid of once you get it. I'm just looking here. Ah. Oh, looks like the whole 4-H group is there. Good. Anybody else have questions? This wasn't really a um, 
talk on lambing and kidding, but it had a lot of lambing and kidding things in it. We do have a, somewhere I have my video posted actually on lambing and kidding. If anybody needs that, I'd have to go find the link, but if you email me, I could send it to you. Okay. I, I, I do have one more question if I could. Yeah. Um, about mastitis. I, I've had a couple of yous um, turn up with mastitis unexpectedly, which then causes more bottle lambs. And I tend yeah. not to rebreed um, if they've lost, you know, one or both um, teats to mastitis. And I'm just wondering, my barn is clean before lambing. They're on hay bedding. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's if it's something that's hereditary or if there's something that I'm doing or is it more of a product of uh, you that has multiple births? Um, but it definitely seems to be a, a cycle. Are you getting like the, the purple gangrene mastitis? I haven't had gangrene. Um, the, a couple of them um, I don't even realize until they lamb um, that maybe one of the teats is not functioning not or working. one half of the, yeah. And I did have one you this year that, um, got engorged almost two weeks before she lambed. And in, in hindsight, after talking to my vet, I should have milked her out a little bit, but I was afraid to mess with her udder. Um, or lose the colostrum. Right. I mean, he, my vet said I could milk it out and freeze it, but that sometimes, doing that would trigger, um, trigger her to labor. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it that early. Um, See, and I would so think that would be worse because now you've unplugged the teats. Well, that's, really that's exactly what I thought as well. But sure enough, when she lambed and she had quads, um, I, I milked it out to, just to get the, rid of the engorgement. And she was full blown double mastitis. Like there was nothing Ooh. usable in that udder. And sometimes um, it sometimes they actually get the mastitis when you dry them off. Like my ewes have a lot of milk. And so we now the ewes at the extension farm, we now don't wean until like a hundred days because they're on pasture with their mothers. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier on them than when we used to be on the star system and we would pull the lambs early and then they'd have those big udders. You'd have to keep them super clean. And then if they have a lot of multiples and you got all those lambs like butting their udders over the years, I find, yeah. you know, by the time they're eight or nine years old, their udders are just beat up basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is. It, so it's, mastitis is very frustrating in sheep because you can't usually pinpoint where you got it from or when they got it because they're only lactating for that time when they got the lamb with them. And, you know, then usually you, you watch their udders go down, but you don't really. I sometimes think they get infected then, and then uh, it shows up when they freshen again in the spring. Right, right. That's exactly what happened. All right. Well, thank you. It sounds like there's not necessarily anything different to do. <laughs> no. Thank you. More of the same. <laughs> okay, Gabby. All right. Can you hear me good? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly so we can have time for questions after. Um, I'm going to just get rid of my video here. Okay. Um, so like Betsy said earlier, you know, with colostrum, uh, the absorption capacity decreases over time significantly after two hours. So, um, in order to go and have proper immune function for our lambs and kids, we wanna to try to get that colostrum in them as soon as possible. Um, and with that, sorry, it's hard to advance this slide. Okay. So along with quality, we wanna work with our quantity too of colostrum. Um, they go hand in hand. So if uh, you use a refractometer or a Brix reader, um, you want a 24% or higher. Um, for solids, uh, for colostrum, for the first feeding. And I have a picture in a slide later on to show you what a refractometer looks like and um, the options for that. Um, you can use, like Betsy said, a colostrum replacer. Um, and 
I would suggest trying to go and do your research and find out which ones are higher quality. And um, these uh, tend to be a little bit better to, I guess it's not always the best to use, but um, one of the positives would be it helps eliminate uh, disease transfer versus using um, the mother's colostrum. Um, and I forgot to mention before, you can pasteurize the colostrum and that will go and make it um, uh, free of uh, disease for the lambs and kids. Um, and if you have a lower quality colostrum from a uh, lamb or doe, or sorry, a ewe or doe, then you can go and um, use a replacement or uh, use a donor um, colostrum. So for quantity, we want one ounce per one pound of body weight. So the example I have here is a six pound kid or lamb um, will receive six ounces of colostrum per feeding. We want to go and try to make that to about three feedings of colostrum over a, a longer period of time, like about a day or so. Um, and this is gonna go and help support the cat, or sorry, not the calves. I work with calves way too much. So <laughs> if I say calves, my apologies, for the lamb or kids um, immunity. So when it comes to a uh, bottle feeding, uh, lambs and kids, um, we don't wanna go and feed cow's milk or cow's milk replacer that is meant for calves. Um, it's a different protein makeup and it's not as easily digested. Um, so we should try to shoot for a species specific milk replacer. However, goats can drink lamb milk replacer, but lambs cannot drink goat milk replacer. And the reason for that is because of the copper that's in the goat milk replacer and also the differences in protein and fat content since lambs need a higher um, fat percentage than goats. Um, however, there are also Capri ovary um, OV products that uh, have a lower um, amount of copper in them and uh, more of a middle of the road type uh, protein and fat. So uh, there are products like that available. Um, milk replacer is pasteurized. Um, so that helps with the biosecurity issue with disease. Um, and uh, for options of acidification, there's partially or fully acidified uh, milk replacers. So this kind of deters bacterial growth um, when it comes to free choice feeding. So we can have it sitting out in a feeder for a little bit longer and not have that bacteria grow as rapidly as, as it would. Um, without it being acidified, but it also helps enhance the gut health and digestion. And I've also seen it, um, it helps prevent overeating. Um, so that will help with our, our bloat um, and our flare-ups of clostridium. Uh, and then also milk replacers, uh, you can get it that contain decox and this helps present, pre <coughs> sorry, prevent against coccidiosis. So when it comes to mixing milk replacer, um, I'm not gonna go through all this step by step just for time's sake, but um, we want to go in, uh, I would say first thing is we wanna go and follow the, the bags instructions for milk replacer um, because everyone is different and unique. However, for the most part, when it comes to uh, mixing the milk replacer. We want a temperature of 110 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and anything higher than uh, 140 will denature the proteins. It's pretty much just going to cook and that's not going to be able to go and be as easily digested um, uh, or available to be digested. And then less than 110, um, when it comes to mixing, you're going to have a harder mixing time and you'll possibly have more clumps since that uh, fat is not fully broken up. Um, so as we go down through the steps, you want to keep in mind in the winter months or in the months that are a lot colder, um, uh, we want to go and make sure that we're having the powder stored in a cooler um, location. However, we don't want it to be, you know, outside in the shed because a cold powder will reduce that temperature for when it comes to mixing it. Um, 
And you want to feed it at less than 105 uh, to prevent burning. And uh, like Betsy said, you can use a drill, a whisk um, to go and mix everything. So when it comes to milk nutrition, um, the percent solids that we want to shoot for within uh, less than two weeks or during our very cold conditions would be 18 to 20 percent. Um, I would say 18 is definitely the most common and probably recommended. That way you're not feeding possibly too high of solids if you're not uh, mixing your milk replacer and water correctly. Um, so uh, you can lower it to 15% as the intakes increase um, and the lambs and kids get older. Um, so the example we have down below kind of just shows, uh, and I'll get my pointer out, kind of shows here uh, what percent solids would look like with how much milk replacer in ounces that we are putting into water. Um, and so when I say into water, we're not measuring out a quart and we're not dumping the milk replacer on top because we're going to have a higher volume and less solids. So we could essentially be almost underfeeding um, our lambs and kids by doing this. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, for volumes, uh, we want one ounce per pound of body weight. That still applies. Um, however, our exceptions are for our auto feeders and our mob feeders. Um, and we can increase with body weight as the animal grows. And I have a chart coming up that will go and show that. Um, for frequency, we want to feed around three plus times per day. And this will be where we see the best performance and the least amount of illness. And this mimics their natural behavior as much as possible as if they are nursing with mom. So here's a chart to kind of uh, go over what I was talking about with our solids. So, um, and how we can adjust accordingly to go and still meet our percent, so or our percent solids that are needed. Um, so, you know, for example, if we have a 10 pound uh, kid weight, and we're feeding 10 ounces per feeding. This is three times a day feeding. That's gonna get us to our 18% solids. So our total pounds per solids per day would be 0.34 pounds a day that um, of solids that they will be receiving. Oops, trying to get rid of my laser pointer. So like I mentioned before with the refractonomer, um, we have the options of a digital and optical. Uh, the optical one, uh, which is the one on top, that is, this one in specifics is one that honestly you can get from Amazon for $18 and it works pretty decent for being, you know, $18. Um, however, we have ones down here, like the digital ones, and this is well over, you know, two to $300. Um, and it's, however, it's a little bit easier to use. If you have a larger operation, this could make more sense to go and do that. Um, to go and figure out the solids though for, um, for a milk replacer, uh, there's some math involved using these. Um, so you're just, you're better off following the tag instructions, um, and, uh, making sure like your solids are correct. However, um, it's just a little bit more complicated with the math being involved and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So if this is something that uh, there is a question on, it could definitely go and help you out. But we're pretty much going to be following so the Gabby, same. Yep. Good. So how does this work? Do you put a drop of milk replacer on them somewhere and shine a yeah. light through it? Yeah. So uh, let me get my pointer. So kind of talking about for one second, the math, it's the same math that is right here. Um, okay, uh, so you would go and place a drop of uh, colostrum or uh, your milk replacer if you were 
let's just let's just go to classroom first. <laughs> so you'd place a uh, thing of classroom on here. You'd go and look through this end as you go and close that down, and that will go in. Uh, have light shining through on the other end to go and line up what it is reading. Where this you okay. place just one drop, close it, press the button, go, and your Briggs reading is right there. Okay, um, thanks. So it's fairly simple. Um, however, milk replacer is different than colostrum and you have to go and do a little bit more math um, to the readings that it's, uh, it's giving than just colostrum where the Brooks reading is the Brooks reading. Um, so for auto feeders, uh, I worked very, very much involved and closely with uh, calf auto feeders for quite some time. So I'm more well-versed in that than I am with the lamb and kid auto feeders. However, these are much more simplified versions of the, our, um, like Forrester Technic, uh, Lely's, De Laval's, all those calf feeders. Um, it's the most efficient way to grow lambs as quickly as possible since they're able to drink more frequently. However, depending on the size of your operation, it can be cost effective because you can save on labor costs um, or it, you have, or and you can have increased gains. However, there's the cost associated of setting up the machines, which are honestly fairly, I would say inexpensive compared to calf feeders. And I would say even more so now, um, they're more inexpensive because I know the pricing for calf feeders have gone down. So I'm assuming the uh, lamb and kid feeders have also gone down as well. Um, Gabby, I, I just looked at one this afternoon uh, quick from Premier because I was looking at uh -huh. something else and it was about $2,000, which sounded like a lot, except it said it could feed 120 lambs. So yeah, yeah. So that's a lot I know of lambs. I know these ones, like I have the links here um, that when we send out the presentations, you guys can go and click on and check out the videos, but um, I by no means have no preference to the Forrester Technic ones. However, I just, like I said, I'm more well-versed with the calf ones. So these are ones that I know are fairly, really reliable machines and they do a good job. And I know they said that it would feed up to 220 lambs or kids um, with with eight stations per feeder, I think, it had the heating capacity to do that. So, um, but like I said, it's all in the brochure and the links and the videos too. Um, but costs associated with that would be uh, increased milk replacer usage, which, you know, how much it depends. I don't think it's honestly that much more since uh, they're on free, or since they can go and drink more frequently. However, um, you're getting the gains associated with that, but you also have the cost of the auto feeder itself and then the maintenance. So uh, with the auto feeders, we have adjustable portion sizes. So we can go in, um, adjust how much the lambs and kids are going to be able to consume we can set um, the mixing feeding, or it has a set mixing and feeding water temperature. So um, that's fairly consistent and it doesn't vary and it's a perfect meal blended in each, um, each portion to be consumed. Um, there's a semi-automatic cleaning that we can go and set up. And yeah, so here's where it feeds around 220 lambs kids simultaneously at eight feeding stations per feeder. So like I said, if you have a big operation, it would maybe make sense to go in to have that. Um, so for nutrition, uh, we want a high quality pellet where we don't have any fines. Um, we can start giving kids small amounts within the first week. However, we wanna go and make sure that they're actually gonna eat it. You don't wanna waste your money um, and they might not have the desire to really go and pick at it. Um, so uh, it's gonna be closer to weaning is where they're gonna intake on uh, grain intake, uh, or they're gonna increase, sorry, on grain intake and where, um, uh, sorry, 
don't know <laughs> where I was going with that. Um, but yeah, they're going to increase on grain intake closer to weaning because we're going to decrease on our um, milk intake is what I wanted to say. Uh, so we can change the starter um, and maintain freshness. Um, sometimes this is just as simple as stirring it around. Like I said, try to go and start off with smaller amounts. If they keep cleaning that up, then by all means, keep giving more. Um, and they should hit about half a pound per kid per day before weaning. Um, so starter intake and water consumption go hand in hand. Having 24 seven access to fresh clean water is really, really important. Um, when I was managing calves, we cleaned the water feeders every day um, and I would clean it out or hit the plug, go and let the water drain out, uh, spray it with a chlorine solution and scrub it with a brush and then it'd go and fill back up and I'd plug the plug back in um, and then fill back up with the water and I'd have the calves standing right there all huddled waiting to go and drink at the water because they really, really like the taste of fresh clean water. Um, and that will correlate with having higher grain intake. So uh, just for some specs, uh, one, pound, one pound of starter equals about four pounds of water intake and warm, warmer water is preferred. So for weaning, um, there's a eight, weak milk feeding period. So we want to start weaning kids at least, uh, you know, a week or two before weaning. Um, some methods of weaning would be dilution of the milk. So this is a gradual step down with powder to water ratio, where we're decreasing the powder, um, increasing the water. So we're ultimately decreasing the total solids within the milk, um, reducing the number of feedings per day, um, for if we're feeding in the mob feeders, only allowing access to nipples for 50% of the day. However, this could lead to a higher risk of overeating and bloating um, since they're going to be essentially slug feeding um, during those times. And for the auto feeders, um, we can use the valves to go and shut off the lines. Um, but like I said, it's still going to, we could still have those problems. Um, with overeating. Uh, so um, some other tips would be maybe feeding electrolytes in the water during and after weaning. Um, this kind of helps uh, uh, kind of calm everything and like get them a little less stressed um, and gives them a little extra boost of energy. Um, but we don't ever want to compound stressors at weaning. So our examples of that would be like dehorning or vaccinating or moving all at the same time of weaning because we're going to have a negative feed intake um, with our grain, especially. Um, and then after weaning, we're going to have a harder time to go in, get back to the gains that we worked so hard to get. Um, and it's not recommended to go in, move lambs or kids until about two weeks after weaning. Um, like I said, so they don't uh, have that stressing period and they don't go and have that uh, negative intake period. So in summary, um, lambs and kids need a higher level of colostrum and environmental temperature to thrive. Sanitation is really, really important and um, prevention is key. So if, if you can go and make sure that you're doing your best to go and uh, be proactive and cleaning then that's going to lead to less uh, health issues. Um, oh, sorry, one second. <laughs> uh, you can prevent clostridium bloat as much as possible with vaccinations, good quality milk replacer when it comes to mixing, temperature, um, and feed amounts. And like Betsy said, we need to treat them like the infants they truly are. They're like little babies. Um, so we got to make sure we be patient and we give them a lot of care and attention. So Gabby, um, we mentioned vaccinating there. I assume that would be like CDT. And uh, ideally you'd give it to the mothers ahead of time so that when yeah. they get it in the colostrum. Yeah. Uh, because they can't really, you could vaccinate them at birth but it won't really have a lot of effect. Right, yeah. They need to be a couple weeks old, but it is, it is important. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if we have anybody on the call who's using a automatic feeder. Oh, and I did want to mention, I do have, if anyone is interested, I do have more information and contact for um, who carries them in the U.S. I know the closest place is in Auburn, New York, so that's like two hours uh, west from here. So I can get you in connection with that. And I do know they do, um, they sell them, they have some in stock already. So I called and asked, <laughs> and they also do repairs too and maintenance, which is really important because there is hardly anyone that does maintenance for the calves. <laughs> One, that's why I had to know so much about them. Um, but yeah, any questions? I'm sorry, I kind of ran through that really fast, but I want to make sure we had time for questions. It's those must have a thermostat on them so that they um, heat them water. The water comes in and it warms it right in the. Um, it's a feeder. it's a yeah a boiler, they have it installed internally. Cool. The only place I've seen well actually in Europe, I was traveling around France and even in uh, a few bottle lambs they use a little a really cute little, looks like a coffee made like a giant coffee maker that makes uh, that fed their bottle lambs they they don't do anything by hand that way. Mm -hmm. Another place I've seen them is on a really big farm out in Western New York, Matt Kyle's place. Yeah. Like 5,000 ewes, so he has quite a few bottle lamps, and he has, like, tubing strung all over. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Here's a new message here. Hold on. I can get my scroll down, scroll down here. Do, Do you, you recommend? recommend Go ahead. You Go ahead, Gabby, you can read it. Okay. Do you recommend cooling off milk temperature at a certain age or keep it warm right through until weaning? I, I know my answer, but I know sometimes it's not always practical. I mean, I would always feed my calves warm milk. So to me, it seems crazy to go and feed cold milk for lambs and kids. But um, when it's in a... Um, a mob feeder or something like that, it's it's gonna eventually probably cool down if they're not drinking it as fast as possible. Right. So um I would I would still, you know, feed it starting off warm if it turns colder then it's not the end of the world. But right. you just want to make sure it gets warm enough to go and break down the fat globules and they can go and digest it as easily as possible. I do know at Cornell they feed all cold milk replacer, even to the new lambs. But they don't have lambs that were in trouble. They just have lambs that they took away because they're milking the ewes mm -hmm. after they've had colostrum. Yeah, I think it's just based on preference, I guess. I just would feel too bad to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like when it's cold out that it'd be nice to not feed them ice cold milk replacer. And they do shiver, like the ones at Cornell, you see them, they shiver and they go stand under the heat lamp. So mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt them. They seem to grow really well, but. Um, but they're using to... energy to go and reheat right. their bodies when they can use that towards growth. That's so. true. But yeah, good question. Other questions Any other? out there? Like I said, you can unmute yourselves or you can put it in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable with. Well, we may have maxed out an hour and a half on Zoom is about all anybody can I know. take. <laughs> I know, hopefully you're all not sleeping. <laughs> oh, do you ever have airlocks in the lines of milk machines? Are you talking about auto feeders or are you talking about actual yes auto feeders okay um no i would say not because well so how these are is it's just like gravity flown up to the nipple where the calf ones are a little bit more complex where there is wall mounted pumps in addition to gravity flown ones um so, but like you, you shouldn't have any issues with the, with the lines getting blocked with air. 
it might be, it might take a, like a few seconds for them to prime the milk out through the lines, um, but it's not gonna, there shouldn't be any issues after that. I wondered about that too, because some of those lines are pretty long. So you have to, Yeah. you couldn't hand milk it to the nipple too, I suppose. Yeah. They sometimes like in the beginning they get a little impatient, but they'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, but I haven't heard anyone have that issue. So Gabby, there were a few people uh, that came in after we started, so this is being recorded. So we will probably send yeah. the recording out to people, right? Yes. There's also another question. I had some oh. nipples lambs would push air into the lines rather than draw up milk. Hmm. Huh. So yeah, that sounds like more of an, the nipple issue rather than the lines. Um, but I know like they, they make for those auto feeders specific nipples to go for those lines. So you shouldn't have that backflow. They also, I noticed that the premier one has like little anti backup valves that go on there. Yeah. That might help too. I think also though the positioning of where the nipple is would help from that happening. Like whether it be tall, like taller up on the wall or lower. I'm assuming the lower than the less possibility for air, but. Hmm. Any other questions? Like Betsy said, it's going to be recorded and um, I'll send out a, um, I just realized we never sent out a reminder email. <laughs> <laughs> and we had honestly like everyone attend. We had 22 people. A um, very dedicated <laughs> audience tonight. That's great. Yeah, that never happens. <laughs> but I will send up a follow-up email and they'll have the link um, and then a PDF of the presentations we can send to um, yep. I'll have to for the link for the video on demand that you all can rewatch the presentation. Yeah, that way if you miss the beginning, you can catch the first part. Great. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Remember, if you have questions, you can always um, give Gabby or I a call also or an email at our office. We'd be happy to talk with you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. If anybody needs uh, experience lambing, we'll be lambing towards the end of April at the Extension Farm. If you're near Canton, you want to come out and get some hands-on lambing experience, just let me know. <laughs> and we will be having goats, but I don't think they're coming until June. Okie Well, everybody have a great night, and it was uh, great to talk with you all. Thank you. Good night, Gabby. <laughs> Good night, Betsy.